So a part of Lawrence is in the fiber and the fabric of your piece. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for presenting, Whitney. It's been a joy to have you. Oh, thank you. And I also have an outro to read for Whitney. Well, to read by Whitney. It's not a chore, you know, to read for Whitney. Um, do you want to read it? No! Okay! <laughs> um, I pretend I've not been having a back and forth with Whitney for three minutes. I don't know where Whitney is. Um, just so you know, and I hope to see her later, Whitney would like to thank Teresa Buchheister for putting together this fantastic festival. <laughs> and Garland Jude <laughs> for their sublime wit and sar sartorial. <laughs> Warming up your stool, Xavier. <laughs> For their sublime wit and sartorial sorcery, that's me. Um, Whitney also writes daily diary comics. I love that, I want to know more about that. And sends a weekly newsletter, weekly, which you can see at patreon.com slash Whitney Matheson. Everyone can clearly see this, right? <laughs> You're welcome. Or on Instagram at at the Whitney Matheson. I'll be following. Why are you following you on Instagram? Thanks. And now there's the Patreon and a newsletter. I'm very excited. I wrote the bit about myself, just so you know. No, I didn't. I don't even know what sartorial means. So I didn't write it. I promise you. But I'm sartorial. I'm gonna start doing that in the daily. Hi, what's your name? Anthe. Anthe? I'm Garland and I'm sartorial. Wow. <laughs> and very sexy. Ooh! Goodness. My favorite audience yet. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So nice to see things more than once, because you know, I see other little gems and nuggets and magic flex come through. So thank you for doing two shows. It's lovely to see them both. So we have three more shows. You ready for number two? Yeah. Our next presenter is Xavier Rice. And Xavier is a multidisciplinary artist, originally from the Midwest. Fantastic. Um, and Xavier throughout the festival has been experimenting with different forms of storytelling and each of the nights has been new stories which I was gagged over. That's so lovely, writing new stories for each night. So I'm excited to see which stories we hear from Xavier tonight. So give it up for Xavier Rice. I appreciate my I get warm up music. I'm gonna sit on the stool tonight. I hope you don't mind. Oh, thank you, darling. I appreciate it. Um, I figured tonight I was gonna talk to you a little bit about faith or belief or some bullshit. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I'm a Leo. Oh, who's a Leo in the house? Oh, okay. And who just believes in astrology? Who falls? Uh oh, everybody falling for that bullshit. You not my, he might not like me tonight. Uh, <laughs> I, I am a Leo, which is a fire sign. My rising, so a Leo, that means I had to look this shit up. It, with, the Leo is in my eighth house. Yeah, I can tell. Oh yeah, right? Um, so I just, it says that I like to distinguish myself from others by using, okay, wait for it, darkness, feels like a cheap joke, <laughs> taboos, rebirth, sex, and transformation. 
My rising is a Sagittarius, which is also a fire sign. It means that I'm sensitive, optimistic, loud, and introspective. And my ascending is a Sagittarius, which means that I am a good conversationalist, but I can be loud, annoying, and sometimes people think I'm rude because it looks like I'm disinterested. Now, <laughs> I'm sure the person cackling in the back knows that that is not like me at all. <laughs> Instead of right on the fucking money. Um, but I still don't believe in it, I refuse to, right? Um, I uh, once in college played Miss Cleo at a fraternity party. <laughs> now, probably you do, if you don't know, who, oh, if you don't know who Miss Cleo is, we're of a different generation and date. Um, but she used to do telemercials, so you would make a phone call. I mean, yeah, just the telephone. It was a service on the phone. You could call someone you didn't know and couldn't see, and they would tell you some bullshit. Um, at the fraternity, I had a little counter with a little tip, little, little tip jar on it, and I wrapped my head up. And I used this fake Jamaican accent and I would be like, hey, I'm call you're calling to be checking on the boyfriend when I should be checking up on you. <laughs> so at this holiday party, dressed as Miss Cleo, um, I attempted to be, uh, you know, a little bit sexist and funny. And when this woman came up to me, this young lady in the fraternity, um, or a gay brother, I was going to go with the joke. Oh, do you have a, I'm looking at her palm, you know. Oh, do you have a little black in you? Expecting to use some good old sexual harassment fun, would you like it, eh? right, 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 right? She started to cry. Oh. Not because I hurt her sensitivities, but because she had some black in her. Yeah. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> How did you know it's my dad? Oh my God. <laughs> I just looked at her and was like, I don't know, I'm Miss Cleo, I know, and pointed to my tip jar, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she walked into the place believing one thing and left thinking somebody was believing something different about her, thinking they saw something different. <laughs> you know, you actually have, if you walk into the theater, there's a uh, palm reading uh, little device Maybe it's not a device, it's artwork. But there's a palm out there and it shows you all the places that they use to like, you know, the, the, this, just like the ring of Saturn, the finger of Uranus, the Jupiter's moon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all that shit. Um, I love it, I just love it. You're taking a little bit of fact, I can see my own hand, and gluing a bunch of bullshit to it. <laughs> and this is the best place the theater where we just do this. We take a little bit of what we see and know, and the rest is just bullshit. <laughs> but, and I also, I, I'm gonna take a note because one of the other audiences uh, called this out on me the other day. I don't always mean bullshit as a pejorative, okay? So just so we're aware. I usually use the word shit just to truncate things I don't wanna say or things you don't want me to say or things that I assume you don't care about, you know what I mean? Um, I think that Naruto's entrance in episode 45, season five of Naruto Shippuden, when he attacks pain, is one of the best hero entrances in all of media. Thank you. Thank you. But they don't care about that shit. That's some good shit, you know what I'm saying? You know, I could probably use my time to talk about Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Emma Till for that matter. Needs to be talked about. Or maybe you don't care. <laughs> but ain't that some sad shit? We already know. It's some sad shit. I can talk about how delicious my waffles are, how the maple and brown sugar syrup drips all over it, and the homespun butter is blah, 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 blah. But I ain't got time for that shit. It's good shit. <laughs> all right? So I don't use it to curse. I just use it to truncate. What was I talking about earlier? I don't know either. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 science. So, yeah, I, am a, I don't believe in things I can't touch, for the most part. Um, it's how I have to really feel at something. So the universe sends me solid signs. And as a, I am a Leo and a fire sign through and through, the universe sends me fire for signs. 
when I'm smoking my reefer, because I do love to smoke my reefer. But I'm a singer. I shouldn't be smoking reefer all the time. I burn a little bit in the back of my lungs. Oh! Reminds me to puff, puff, and pass. You see, that's the universe. Saying, don't be a stoner. Keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? I once worked at the Olive Garden. No one should ever work at the Olive Garden. <laughs> I contemplated quitting so many times, and should have. You know, sometimes you gotta quit that job, even if it's paying you and stable and you gotta worry about it. I once served this man 16 bowls, continuous, of the endless pasta bowl. <laughs> he would come in often, and every time he came in, he would, they would put him in my section because I like talking to people and he liked talking to me. Well, I would bring him bowls of bowls of Alfredo sauce. Eventually, I was reaching into the breadstick oven to pull out breadsticks fast enough to feed them like I was feeding logs to a train and I burnt my hand. Lesson fire told me to get the fuck out of there. And once in college, I set my whole face on fire. My, um, I was a freshman in college and I didn't believe who I was. I was still trying to impress people. So I wound up at another fraternity event. I was with my Allah. Back then they used to call women who would hang out with gay men fag hags, but we were advanced so I would call her an Allah, alternative lifestyle assistant. Um, I really appreciate that we've evolved from that. Now we're just like my girlfriend, you know what I mean? And even then we're like, who uses girl anymore? <laughs> like, you know, God, of evolution, you know? But I was at this fraternity party with my girlfriend trying to impress some guy. And um, they introduced me. I was acting a little bit by then. I had come out my freshman year of college, but I didn't want to be just one thing and seen just one way. You know what I'm talking about? Because I'm a diverse individual and I don't actually like dick that much. And um, <laughs> I was at this fraternity tribe. You know, oh, God, I keep doing that. Oh, there it is. I, this is my battle toys. I was at this fraternity party. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were, I was trying to impress people, so I was cocktailing, you know, in, I was a raging alcoholic. My parents thought I was a great student. I got there on like a scholarship. I was doing music and you know, it was so great. I was a raging drunk. And I'm at this fraternity party and I'm trying to show off for these cis white males. And they're like, hey, I'm gonna teach you a shot. It's called the Flaming Statue of Liberty. I'd like to point out that I've lived in New York for around 15 years and I've seen the Statue of Liberty once. I was boating past it. Had I woken up on the Staten Island Ferry after leaving all weekend? I don't even know how I got to Staten Island. But I was on there with my little beer and I saw it up there. And it looked so plain and normal. But back in Kansas, it was fancy. And so I was going to do the shot. I was taught this shot called Flaming Statue of Liberty. And I successfully done it five or six times. It is where you take a shot of Bacardi 151. Show shit is right here. I dipped my finger in it. You light your finger on fire. This brother over here knows. This one over here is like, I, I might have heard this shot that you're talking about. You dip your finger in it, you light your finger on fire, you make the pose. What? You take the shot, and then you blow your finger up. What? Yes, honey. So, <laughs> yes, girl. And so I'm a freshman in college trying to be cool at this party. I've done it several times. And I go for my fifth or sixth turn. As the story is told back to me, it was round six, sixth or seventh time that I had done it. I dipped my finger in the alcohol, but didn't completely cover my finger. Lit it on fire, which means I could feel it and thought it would be intelligent to slam the shot quickly so that I could blow it out uh, instead of just blowing it out. <laughs> so I drunkenly took the shot and covered my face with a nice oh. layer of Bacardi 151 and <gasps> Roman candle. I put myself out in the shirt, in my shirt. It was winter time. And if, I don't know, if you, if there's, my brother, if you cut us deep, we turn white underneath. There's a little bit of white skin under there. When I, thank you for confirming, I was like, just, I needed confirmation. We weren't making that up. That's not some bullshit. So we're, we're, so I had put my face out with my shirt. When I came down, I looked like this. Oh. Everyone gasped. I ran outside and shoved my face in the snow because I was wasted and that sounded like it made sense. When I pulled myself out of the snow, apparently the quote which sticks with me is I said, 
Well, at least I didn't lose my eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> After being taken to the university hospital, I then took their painkillers and a bunch of Benadryl and then conceded to drink and party a little bit more. <laughs> a day and a half later, I woke up in my dorm. This eye wouldn't open and this eye wouldn't close. And I was oozing from all over my face. My had to, because you know, I'm an RA, I'm at a university, so they don't care, those doctors might as well be veterinarians. So <laughs> I called my parents to pick me up. And um, my mother came and my father came. This is also the second time they visited me at university. First was to see me in a show, their darling boy, their musical honor student in a show. And the second was to walk in on their child. And my mother opened the door, I opened the door for my mother and she said, my sweet Jesus, Xavier. Look at this room, it is a goddamn mess. <laughs> How do you live like this? You don't live like this, this isn't you. <laughs> Jesus, Xavier, my God, is that your underwear just on the floor for everybody to see? <laughs> my face is melting off and this is what she sees, right? Uh, <laughs> so, they take me to the hospital, I'm in the hospital for three days. Um, I, now, it turned out wonderfully well. I actually had this big old pockmarked teenage pimple spot right here that never went away. Burned it off completely. <laughs> it was like a full facial. Yeah, right? And once I came down to the end of it, um, everything has said and done. I told this wicked lie to my parents. I was like, oh my god, Tommy was making pancakes and oil or grease got on his hand and then his hand caught fire and then he slapped me in the face. <laughs> so after this is done, you're, you know, months out of it, I had to get, it was the whole thing. Um, my dad is sitting down with me and I'm ready to get this disappointing speech about how he's disappointed me a little. And, um, and he goes, well, the, uh, the Lord will, the, lo the good Lord will save your ass about three times in college. <laughs> he rolls up his sleeve to show me a huge uh, brand of a bulldog from his fraternity. Huge, I can't imagine someone getting that intentional. <laughs> the Lord will save your ass three times while you in college. You set your face on fire and you a faggot, so you got like one more. <laughs> and that's how he loves, you know? I'd broken his heart. Well, years after that, <laughs> years, years after that, um, in the before four times, so I don't know if it was like three years ago or 11 years ago, because I just don't know time anymore because of COVID, but a couple of years ago, we had Thanksgiving again, and um, with all the family, the aunts, the uncles, and whatever. And um, I finally recounted, well, my father recounted the story. Well, Xavier was in college, you know, trying to help this guy out making pancakes, and he got in the face. <laughs> Burn himself, making him somebody make pancakes, I don't know how to get it. But... <laughs> and I just felt it necessary to tell him the truth, give him something to believe in. And so I told the whole story. My mother looks at me. My father goes white-faced, pure shock. My mother looks at me and is like, well, Xavier, of course you were lying. Not one bit of that little story made sense. I don't believe it for nothing. You helping somebody. <laughs> My father was broken hearted. A full disappointment. Um, afterwards, uh, I sat with my aunt. She pulled me over and was like, oh, God, Xavier, Jesus, what, what were you thinking? If somebody believes something about you, you just let them believe it, honey. You don't need to give anybody no more fuel for nothing. You keep a secret. You have a secret and you keep it. Thank you.